Ooh. Yeah. Hey, you know, it, it's here's what, here's the deal. It's Thursday. It's nine o'clock. So hey, Tony, call me maybe. Call me maybe. <laughs> We should make one of those. We can you know, do we it should. right here, you know. We probably could. I, we would probably get, you know, at least one one thousandth of a percent of the viewers that are looking at the Miami Dolphins cheerleaders doing it. Who? What? What? They did it? I don't know what you're talking about. There's, there's a rumor <laughs> going around from uh, some of the guys I've heard at Penn State that uh, the Miami Dolphin cheerleaders have done the call me maybe. In fact, Matthew and I were trying to listen to it and watch it streaming on the train coming back from New York City last night, and the Wi-Fi just wasn't up for the task. <laughs> so, so how is life in your tech world? Waiting. Waiting? Waiting. Are you waiting for the Galaxy S3 phone? Waiting. There's just a lot of waiting. Like, um, oh, you know, our company, uh, HP, has its big Discover conference this week. So stuff is kind of being unveiled as we speak on our side. And there's some other company that's got something happening next week and everyone's just waiting to see what the next chapter is in technology so and in an effort to preempt it google came out and said hey we're going to do some really cool stuff for 3d mapping uh now maybe you're more up to speed on this than i am you know, there's some al allegations accusations if you will that that they that google came out and talked about mapping this week to preempt something that Apple is going to be doing next week about maps. Do you, yeah. do you know much of the backstory on that? Something about. Yeah, I mean, I've heard the backstory on that. I also remember, I think, wasn't it Google who tried to preempt Apple with a phone with the <laughs> Nexus before one of the versions of the iPhone came out? That seemed to work well. I, I just don't think <laughs> that works. I mean, everyone's already, I mean, the whole tech press is already geared to, okay, Apple's announcing, and then you come out and and Google announces something. It just seems like they'd be better off letting that cycle run its course, having some clear airwaves um, to, to do, uh, do what they want to do on maps. But I guess, you know, they're trying to counter some of the negative vibes that might come out because it's rumored that Apple, I guess, is going to go its own way on maps, and you're not going to see Google Maps, the default map engine on iOS. Now, I'm really curious. Is, is it going to be not the default, but you'll be able to change it to that as a default? Or will you not even be able to put a Google Map app, say that three times fast, a Google Map app uh, on your iPhone or your iOS device? Uh, that's, that's not clear yet. We'll know next I'd week. Be I think they'd be in all kinds of trouble if you couldn't put any other map apps on the phone. Like even now, you can put a TomTom Tom app on the right, phone. That's, that's what true. I use. But uh, my guess is Google Maps would be replaced as the default map application. Now, the, one of the, uh, the charges I've heard, accusations, and I think it's actually it's true, is that Google's been charging companies more and more for maps. And so you know, we get to use their mapping for free. A lot of small companies get to do the API hooks for free. Mm -hmm. But the larger companies, they were charging them for it. So Apple and many others are moving to, I guess they call it op OSM, open source mapping. Uh, it, it's it's part of that free movement, and so there these map designs are available free of charge. Now the question is, is it going to be as as good as what you can get when Google throws not only satellite imagery but all the cars that are driving, validating the roads, and and everything else that they've got, all that technology and the money that they're throwing at it. And now the big announcement they had is that they're going to be doing 45 degree angle photography yeah. with aircraft flying over with four cameras plus you know, straight up and down shots. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone should be surprised by this move by Apple. I think it was, I'm just doing a search here, I think it was October of last year, Apple bought um, a mapping company, um, Poly9, I think it's called, a, three, a 3D mapping company. So I think that kind of, you know, signal that they were looking to go in, in a different direction direction with maps. And I think now we're just seeing the follow through on that. Um, I don't imagine Google's surprised. And it's kind of hard to blame any of these companies, uh, whether it be Facebook or Apple or Samsung at some point, looking to have more control over that experience because it's such a popular feature on all these devices for a lot yeah, of absolutely. people. Absolutely. And yeah, so, for me, you know. 
You know, we, we, we arrived in New York City yesterday morning. We took the train in the morning, came back in the evening to go to the Blog Expo, and the first thing that, that we did was whip out our phones and, and say, okay, where is the Javits Center, and how do I get there? Mm -hmm. now, it I ended up having Matthew and me walk completely around the big complex before we got to the door. Yeah. It was probably my own inability to read maps, but... Uh, yeah, it's 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 becoming a ubiquitous feature for anybody that that walks, drives, or otherwise moves from point A to point B. Yeah, I got that wrong. It's C3 Technologies that Apple bought. Oh, okay. C3 Technologies last October. So I guess we're going to see some of that probably replace what they're doing with Google. And uh, you know, it, I don't think it's also any secret that Google and Apple are becoming more and more adversaries than partners and so I think you're going to see both companies probably look to take steps like this. And I was hearing some stories that uh, Tim Cook has come out and said that one of the things that he's going to do at Apple is make them more secretive <laughs> which uh, go all in on secretive which is going to be interesting. Next week is mm -hmm. going to be interesting because they're saying that Johnny Ives is has come out and said that these are the designs that he believes are the best they've ever done, whatever they are, sure. whether it's in WWDC or a later release. You know, I always have an issue when they say that. I mean, they're the best they've ever done. I mean, do you really think, <laughs> I mean, is it likely that they're going to step backwards with the design and say, oh, last year's was better than this one? No. I mean, so I think any time a company, it's like, you know, any, any new model of a car, they ought to say this is the best they've ever done. If not, I don't think people would say that's odd. You know? Well, I, I think they, Ford, for instance, I think acknowledged it with their latest revisions to the Mustang line for the past five or ten years. I mean, they finally came back and said, no, seriously, 68 Mustang. That was really it. <laughs> that's, that's the best we ever had. And so the new Mustangs, I think, started you know, giving an homage to, to the 68 Mustang. I think these Mustangs look really good, and we're not paid by Ford. <laughs> Ford Sync advertisements. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, so, so occasionally you see it, but I, I really cannot imagine Apple coming out going, you know, in hindsight, the original iPhone design, the metal, brush metal was back, much better. was much better than what we're doing now. We're going to do that, but it's going to be bigger. We're going to go with a <laughs> five-inch screen, but we're going to go back to that original iPhone look. <laughs> yeah, with a slower chip and less memory. Yeah, you know, that's where we're going. You know. On the other hand, you know, I, I picked this uh, device up. I'm going back to the handset for phone calls, so... Uh, <laughs> I think my kids would look at that and say, what is that? <laughs> I don't think they've ever seen one of those. Seriously, I don't think they've ever seen one of those. Yeah, you know, tie this with a touch tone or tie it with a dial on a phone and, and the kids would be completely confounded. Um, this is, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about blog and new media expo Matt and I went to. Uh, but this is one of the first things we ran across was this company called Overblog. Uh, just mention their name once or twice, and you can go look up overblog.com for the listeners that want to go find out about it. But what they gave us was a, a, a phone handset. My first thought was it plugs into your computer, and that's kind of cool. Use it with Skype. And then I looked at it, and then I started thinking about it. I go, wait a second, it's only one connector. This plugs into, your phone is a silly thing to plug it into. But <laughs> plugging it into your tablet that has Skype and a microphone cable enabled to it. You know, when you think about it, this becomes a nice little device, if only to pretend you're the nationwide insurance guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I can walk up, I can be on a call, and I go, nationwide is on. They don't sponsor us either. What the heck am I doing? <laughs> but, you know, you and I have talked a couple times about going to blog expos and... I didn't even know this one was going on. I got an email from uh, Raw Voice, the guy who does the Blueberry uh, podcast plugins and those sorts of things. And it ca email came Monday night, Tuesday morning. And I looked at it and I said, you know what? I really got to jumpstart some of this uh, sponsorships and, and figuring out how to get listeners and how to capture data coming off of not only Real Tech for Real People, but SCToday.net, my, my supply chain blog and podcast. And so I decided to go for the exhibits only. And then I told Matthew that I was heading out Wednesday morning on the train, and he decided he wanted to go too. And, you know, he's an adult, and I wasn't going to talk him out of it. Uh, and it, it was a very interesting day. We, we learned a lot of interesting things. I'm going to recommend a couple uh, companies. Most importantly, uh, Rackspace.com was there, uh, the cloud service provider. Mm -hmm. 
And the weirdest moment for me is Matthew's talking to the guy from Rackspace about uh, an application idea that they have, and so he's talking to the sales guy about how they want to put data in the cloud and secure it and these sorts of things. And this man comes up and standing next to me like he's just waiting for me to introduce myself. I'm looking at him. I'm going, man, you look awful familiar. And I look at him again and look back to Matthew and look at him again. And then he pulls his name tag out he had in his pocket, and, and I see Scoble. Oh, oh, there you go. Hey, Robert Scoble, how are you doing? I need to have my picture taken with you. <laughs> <laughs> so the scobalizer was there. The was scobalizer, kind of cool. yeah. yeah. Uh, He's good. But they're gonna, there's going to be a few things coming out uh, that you and I are going to, our, our listeners will see rolling out here in the next few weeks. There's a couple different ways we can bring more video in uh, to the show. We're doing Google Air now, but uh, Spreecast, S-P-R-E-E-C-A-S-T, allows you to host a, a, multiple people into the call, bring them, get, get, put them on, the camera, put them in a chat room, uh, have private conversations on the side, have somebody say, hey, I want to get on and talk to you for a minute. You can have a private conversation, say, what do you want to talk about? They tell you, they pop them into the conversation on camera, just like we're doing here now, a little bit more advanced than Google Plus, uh, the Google Air that we're on right now, but uh, kind of a, a really interesting way to do conferencing. It records it, saves it, allows you to post it on your website as well as streaming live, which I think we're streaming live right now on Google+. Plus. I know we have, it says we have two viewers right now. Nice. So, and that's, more, that's more than me and you, I hope. I think it is, because last time we dropped down to one viewer, and I wasn't quite sure how or why we dropped down to one viewer. Where, where do you uh, see that, by the way? Let's see. Upper, upper right-hand in. corner. I see mic on, camera on, exit. Right below that, do you see anything that says embed or? I don't. And maybe that's because you're the host or something. Uh, you see that and I don't. I'm not sure. Yeah. Hmm. Or maybe I'm just completely losing my mind here. We'll figure this out some other time. Okay. No problem. The, there's a couple other things I'll spread out over the next uh, couple episodes. Uh, one guy has a company out there that's designing a way to stream video. It's a shared video, Simul, Simul TV, I believe it's what it's called, so I'm going to tell you about this one. He, you, you can watch TV and share TV with people across the globe. So you and I could, for instance, log on to this site. They're streaming the live media for regular television channels. I think they said they have 400 different channels that you're able to, to link up and watch and share live television. And so the, their, their advertisement shows the daughter in the United States and the soldier in the field with the notebook computer. They're watching a show together, and you, they see each other on the camera in the corner. It's like a picture-in-picture picture sharing the experience with your friends. Um, it's free right now. It's going to be a subscription service. I kind of left that one going, eh. You know, uh, I think in my family anyway, it seems like the ladies love to do this. Uh. They do. Like, you know, my wife will call up her friend or, or her mom, you know, my mother-in-law. Hey, turn to this channel. Let's watch this. And they'll literally turn to the channel and they'll be sitting there on the phone. Oh, did you see that? Did you hear what he said? She said. And all of a sudden, like an hour's gone by and they've been literally watching the same show on the phone, you know, chatting about it. And it could be her friends, like I said, relatives, and it seems like it's a big deal. I, on the other hand, am more than happy to go, you know, to my DVR <laughs> episode of whatever and watch it in complete isolation and not feel the need to talk to anyone about it. But I do think, you know, there are people who love <laughs> get that communal watching experience, and there probably is a market for this. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I will admit, I've done it a couple times in my life, and really the one person I do it with, shock as this is going to be to some of you, uh, I do it with my brother, and we do it on election night. I was going to say, I bet you it's something you guys can argue about. That you, you Actually, did, right? <laughs> ironically, we both were supporting the same person in, in 2000 when, oh, we were, really? when we were up till 2 or 3 in the morning watching the returns come in watching them declare a winner, retract the winner, declare another winner. <laughs> oh, that one, yeah. <laughs> and finally, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning Eastern time, we both said, I don't think we're going to stay up 
anymore. I, I, I guess I'll just read who won in the morning. And I'm like, the best decision we ever made was to go to bed and mm. not wait for a winner. We'd have been up for, what, two months? Yes, a, wa- a while. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. So, so that was that's the one part. In fact, I, I texted them the other night. And I said, hey, Chris, the returns for Wisconsin are coming in. Uh, you want? To, are you watching it? Should we get on the phone? Yeah, so I definitely think there's a market for it for big events like an election for some, or you know, the finals of American Idol, or you know, where people may do this if the technology was easily there. You know, there there has to be very low barriers, and I think people will do it if it gets too hard, too complex. You got to have this exact setup, whatever. Then I don't think it'll work, but. If it could be easy, touch of a button, I think people would do it. It, it looked, you know, the demonstration we saw, and he was there, and they, they, they did a, a really good job setting it up. They had a couch. He had his daughter sitting there watching TV. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it, it, it was a, a well-designed display. You could tell that this is a startup, and they're putting their, their time and effort and money into it. And and I, I think it's it's got some promise now. Like you say, for me, maybe not so much. I could see... I, I could see wanting to do it if I'm deployed somewhere overseas, want to be able to see my kids, and you know, maybe <laughs> the highlight of my life was sitting on the couch watching Barney with Matthew or, or my girls or something, the Teletubbies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might, that might work out well. The other one that I thought was interesting, and Matthew really sees great value on this one, is something called Raw Porter. R A W P O R T E R. Raw Porter. Yeah, and what was intriguing about it is, you, you, we both were kind of hopeful. You know, Matthew's not 21 yet, so he was less hopeful than I that it was about beer. <laughs> but, but it's a play on the word reporter. So it's like raw video, huh? From video and photographs, and so the idea is they want to help you. Capture the video live that you see, the news happening where you happen to be. Capture that news, upload it to a site where you can then get the benefit of somebody using your photo in the news and paying you rather than somebody stealing it off your Twitter feed Mm -hmm. and not even giving you credit saying the picture came from Twitter. Tony Pittman on Twitter is a source, Twitter. And you can set a price, it looks like? Is that how it works? You can set a price for how much you think the that's picture a, should be worth. That's a great idea. It gets even now, better. Now, whether or not it works or not, I don't know the way they've executed it, but what an interesting idea. Well, it gets even better because they have a, an interesting twist to it where they have uh, the ability to have reporter, reporter assignments. There's a big downside to this, though. Have you thought of it? Uh, No. All right. I wouldn't put it past some people to actually do shocking or bad or illegal things. They already and, do. And stage it and record it and then say, hey, I'm going to post this for a thousand bucks. And you know, and, people. And you know, because right now people do that. You know, CNN has their eye reporters and stuff where you send them a video, they'll, great, thank you. But they don't, I don't think they pay for those. But now if you put a price on them and you have a market for it like this, the downside would be, you know, I could see teenagers or someone doing, hey, let's make a quick book. Let's push Johnny off the roof and let's record it and, you know, then have Mark over there post it and act like he had nothing to do with it, but he'll share the money with us. I mean, that that's a potential downside. But the idea is still a good one. I don't want to throw hot, uh, cold water over it. Well, you know, and the other thing they have is they have uh, the ability to have reporter assignments. And so people say, I need to get a, a reporter, photographer, videographer, to cover this event, mm-hmm. and I'm willing to pay twenty five, thirty, fifty dollars, whatever. And so you can t- you can do this on your iPhone today. You can get the Raw Porter app for iPhone or Android. The one on the iPhone or iOS app is much nicer right now. They admitted that because it turns out, hey, you know, writing two apps is two different apps. Um, <laughs> you log on, you say, here's where I am, and it'll come up and tell you around you. There's five, six, seven opportunities now for raw porting, if you want to go over there in, in the next iteration is going to give you directions from where you are to where the event is and what time it is for them to want you to, to go and report on wow. this sort of thing. This is, this is 
this is hu a huge idea, in my opinion. Huge. Yeah. The, the guy we talked to, it, it's new for him. They're really excited about it. He wanted to come up with a way to get... It. Now, what they do is they charge $5, period, mm -hmm. for, for, for photograph or video. He said, you know, we thought about a 10% charge. You know, the Getty and those folks, they charge 30 40% commissions. So you charge a dollar, they're going to get 40 cents. You charge $100, they're going to get $40. And he said, you know, a lot of people view that, even though it's the same percentage, they view that as taking money from them. He said, so we're just going to make it five bucks. And the purchaser of the image pays the, the commission. So you put up a photo, Tony, for $25. I like the photo for $25. I pay you 25 and I th pay another $5 that goes to Raw Porter uh, for the purposes of the transaction. Yeah. So. I tell you what, future generations are going to have to see a complete rewrite of the Superman uh, character because, you know, there's, there's no way poor Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen uh, <laughs> are going to have a place in society the way things are going. You know, <laughs> the photographer and the reporter running around, hey, go Curry, not going to be happening. You know? yeah. So yeah, yeah. This, that that whole concept is going to have to be completely redone because wow, look at how that whole space is changing. And this well, is not only that, but imagine the the poor guy, Clark Kent, the reporter, when he decides to go from mild mannered to Superman, he will not be able to go anywhere and change out of his mild mannered demeanor and into his superhero costume without somebody photographing him or videographing him. Let alone finding a phone booth. I hadn't even thought of <laughs> you can get one of these and then just hide it out in the corner somewhere. Grab one of these little phones. Off you, you go. A phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> hadn't even thought of that. Where would, where would a modern day Superman find a place to change? Well, in the latest movie, they just had some thing where he just started running like really fast and his like suit just disintegrated. They didn't even try. They didn't even try to put him in a phone booth anymore. Oh, <laughs> you know, that's why I, I, Matthew introduced me to the set of videos that are uh, animations for how the movie should have ended. So they, they kind of do this, how this, the Marvel superhero movie should have ended. Mm -hmm. Batman and Superman are sitting at a table. Batman is talking like this. Uh -huh. like, what, what's your voice? Well, Iron Man comes, sits down with them, to, uh, Tony Stark. And they go, so... How did it go? He says, "Well, you know, I did all this. I saved the world, and then I, then I told them who I was. What? You gave away <laughs> your secret identity?" He goes, oh, "Yeah, <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> what I did was totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> How can you do that?" Uh, and so that's the the biggest things I got out of there for our listeners. Raw Porter. I think everybody who has a phone with an eight megapixel, five megapixel camera does video. You know, you might be interested in that. It's a mindset change for me. Because I was thinking, I watched an accident. I saw the aftermath with, I think I told you about this, the woman who was hit by the car in a pedestrian accident, she got up and directed traffic, told him where to pull his car over to get it out of, the, out of the road. Her arm was all bloodied and cut up from having been slammed into the windshield of the car, but she was directing traffic. And at no, at no point did I think I should pull out my phone and video this. Yeah. See, people, you know, there are a few downsides, because people will do that instead of doing probably what they should be doing and... And let's face it, there will be some people who manufacture bad things, shocking things, right, so they can do it. But I think overall, uh, this is a huge idea, and I think it's things like this that are going to change journalism um, entirely. I mean, journalism already is changing. I mean, look what we're doing. But uh, stuff like this is really innovative, and the technology is, uh, is there, right? These phones... I uh, can do amazing things, and this is an example of how to take advantage of it. Yeah. And you know, part of the, the trick here is that we are able to cross boundaries with this new technology, and, and kind of that's the whole idea behind the New Media Expo. It used to be Blog World, and now it's Blog and New Media World Expo. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the fact we have podcasting, we have the ability to do this video streaming, we have the ability to uh, not just blog, but combine blogs with other things. Uh, and even provide books. In fact, the show was held jointly with the International Book Something or Other Association. And so Matthew and I went into that show. Huge. Huge show. I mean, Mifflin, Houghton Mifflin was there. Random House was there. Uh, Scholastic was there. I mean, you name a publisher you've heard of and you name a thousand you haven't. 
mm-hmm. and they were all there. Uh, it was it was a great time. We we actually talked to some interesting people there too, and made some contacts with some logistics folks in the book world, uh, which will be fun. But everything's changing, and technology is changing in that way. And so one of the things we have to be careful about is I don't know, Tony, have we ever talked about this thing called security? In fact, I think we had a show called Security. Security. <laughs> Security. <laughs> <laughs> we might have. It, it seems like it might be important. <laughs> now, I'll leave the details to, to Steve Gibson over at Security Now, and yet I mention him once again. So since we mention people often, I'll mention Jason Leisure just to toss it in there. Uh, just, was, to, just to throw his name in there. Just yeah. to throw his name, because we haven't mentioned Jason Leisure in a while. <laughs> uh, but see, Steve Gibson talks about the importance of not only having creating a hash for a password, but you can't really just have a hash. You have to have a salted hash. In other words, I take their password, I run it through an algorithm, but I, I put something else in it that only I know mm-hmm. so that only I can get that password back out. Meaning like don't use words right out of the dictionary, that type of thing. Well, because what will happen is you, you come up with a password, one, two, three, four, five, six, mm-hmm. and I hash it with an algorithm. That's fancy. I run it through a big owl algorithm. But if I know you do one, two, three, four, five, six, and I know this is your hash, mm-hmm. I now can figure out the algorithm. I know A and C. I can figure out B. Right. right. And so what? What? And then once you figure out that algorithm, then all I need to know is your hash, and I right. can figure out everybody's passwords. Right. And and so by salting it, by throwing another thing into that algorithm, whether it's I tie it with uh, another piece of information you've given me in your profile, or who knows what I'm going to use, by using that hash. All I do is validate the hash when you type in your password. I run it through that same algorithm. I don't actually store your password anywhere. And so all that, and Gibson does a much better job, much longer job explaining that, all that to say LinkedIn didn't salt their their hashes on the passwords. Yeah, so LinkedIn screwed up, right? And then the data gets exposed, and then um, now I see where you were going. But on top of that, if people use simple words out of the dictionary, they're in trouble. And um, this actually came up, and I sent, uh, you know, when I saw it, I sent an email to, you know, whole distribution list for our organization at work saying, if you use LinkedIn, change your password, like, yesterday. <laughs> like, you know, go change it. Because uh, that's dangerous stuff. And you, you, you can never, you know, it just goes to show you, LinkedIn, growing company, popular, publicly traded, all the good stuff, you know, anyone can have an incident like what apparently happened here. Yeah. And, you, you know, you could be exposed. So I changed my password right away and told others to do the same. And it's best you can do if that happens. But this is the world we live in. You know, we talked about the world we live in and what's changing. This is part of it, too. Yeah. I, and the, the <coughs> worst part is we're having to trust LinkedIn to have done the right thing. Mm-hmm. What happened is somebody in Russia stole the, the list of all the hashes, six, 6.3 million hashes and the usernames that went with the hashes. Well, it, it, they might as well have your password, right? They now have everything they need. Did you go to the leakedin.org site to test your password? No, no, I didn't know about that. Well, I went to leaked, leakedin, L-E-A-K-E-D-I-N.org site, typed in my password, and it comes up and says, here's your hash. Yes, your, your hash is in the list, because they somehow got the list. Oh, so you could tell if yours is in the group that got stolen? That's right. So I, I did mine. It was in the list. I did, Matthew did leaked his. In, Leakedin.com? No, .org. .org, okay. So I, I thought, well, maybe they're just always going to tell you this to try to scare you to change your password. Yeah, so I took my yeah. password, and I, you know, I, one of my numbers well, somewhere Well, mine said there. looks like yours was not leaked. Hooray. Is that your new one or your old one? My old one. Oh, so you were good. Yeah, I changed one number in my password, and it said, "No, you you weren't you weren't hacked." And I'm like, "Yeah, well, that wasn't my password." <laughs> so, <laughs> so I picked a new one using Password Safe, randomly selected one. But I just wanted to let people know these are the two things. One, if you're on LinkedIn, change your password, like you told everybody in your distribution list. You know, I think this is odd though. So I put in my old password, and it said it was not leaked. Hooray! <laughs> exactly what that right. That was my old one. So then I put in the new one, the one I changed it to after the incident, and it says, your password was leaked and cracked. Sorry, friend. How in the world? 
<laughs> that doesn't make any sense at that's all. A, that's a great point. <laughs> great point. Because here's, here's the other thing that can happen is because they are using it to create a hash. They're creating the hash off that password, but they're not tying it to your username. You notice they didn't ask you your username, so they're not capturing right. that at all. What they've done is they're looking at your hash that they create, and they're comparing it to the list of all the hashes they have out there. So mm -hmm. you, what you may have stumbled across is the password you're using is randomly identical to a password that one of the 6.8 million other people had used. Could be. Right? And so it doesn't guarantee that it was hacked, but it does you know, tell you that at least somebody else had that password. Gotcha. Well, anyway... Um the other thing I want to I still think the best thing you can do, right, uh, just for our users is uh, if you do use LinkedIn, you better change your password, right? That's yep. I think that's the clear advice, right? Yeah. And and just, you know, pay attention and, and ask a question occasionally how how passwords are stored on the sites you're going to. I mean, the biggest problem we had with Sony what, 6 months ago is that they stored the passwords in a clear text file, usernames and passwords. Mm -hmm. They didn't even hash it. But what are you going to do? I mean, LinkedIn is so big right now. You know, we're all on it. If you're working in the corporate world or want to be, you better be on it. So, uh, you know, it's like you're going to use it, right? I think yeah. the best thing you can do, though, is pay attention. If, if something like this happens, respond right away, you know. The, the scary part is that, you know, LinkedIn didn't deny that it may have happened. They, they weren't going there. Mm -hmm. But they did say we have yet. This was as of this morning. They had they they were saying we don't know. We don't see any indication it was stolen. Yeah, I'm sure that was very carefully crafted. Well, you know, okay, but I think they they're not they're not denying that it happened. Yeah, they're they're expressing concern now that they don't know how. Which is it's interesting. Of course, the alternative could be. It really wasn't hacked. Um, somebody decided to do this to see if they could make 6.3 million people change their passwords. Right. You know, and the other thing that you, you mentioned, don't pick a word out of the dictionary, those sorts of things. Uh, one, of the th one of the passwords that they typed in, that the reporters typed in, was LinkedIn. So people used LinkedIn as the password. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, the number one password in the world. You know, so know what that list is. Don't use that list because people are going to grab a list of the top 20 passwords and they're more likely than not going to be able to get into a computer system. Yeah, and it's hard. You know, there's some people who just, you know, they don't, they don't have the awareness, they're naive, or maybe they're frustrated, and they just say, look, I'll just make one that I always know. If I go to LinkedIn, you know, I'll never forget that I just use LinkedIn. And one of the things that makes me frustrated is so many different sites have all these different rules for what they require on their passwords. So if you come up with a pretty decent password, all of a sudden you go to some bank or some, oh no, you got to have one, you know, uppercase, one, and all this stuff, and all of a sudden you're like, it's a pretty good password I use everywhere else, now I can't use. Crap, I'll just use, you know, all right, Citibank. You know, I'll just use the name of the bank because I'm annoyed that I got to think of something else, and you don't want to write them down, all this stuff. So, you know, it would be great if there was one strong password standard that that made your sites at least adopted so you could come up with a nice good strong password that you could at least use everywhere because I think when people can't do that they get faded and they do things like well I'll just put it in LinkedIn because it's just too much of a pain to think of something new you know? absolutely and one of the, the interesting mind. things I don't know if you well, and, and you mentioned that you know people come up with a very good password and they use it on everything. Well, that, you know we recommend you don't use the same password on everything, right? Because if something happens like on LinkedIn and they get your username and password, odds are pretty good if you're like me, you're SCM professor everywhere, right? So you know you're Tony Pittman, T Pittman everywhere. I can figure out if I got your one password, I may be able to figure out how to log into five, six, or ten other sites that you're on. A member of. Yeah, that that's true too. That's true too. Now, I, you know, maybe you'd be. Yeah, that's what, again why I, I like password safe. Last pass is good. One pass is good. Things that generate the passwords for you. Uh, the other thing to be concerned about: if you go to a bank and the bank says it must mm -hmm. be eight like characters, if you go yeah. somewhere says it must be eight characters, there's a flaw there. Run. They're not hashing. Yeah. 
Run, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, because they, they are most likely doing some very unsecure and insecure things mm -hmm. with, with the password if that's what they're doing. Uh, so, actually, we didn't have any other tips in the show tonight, so that's, that's our tip there, too. Well, we're at 35 minutes, 36 minutes. You want to uh, roll into our tips? Let's roll. Our, our, picks. Our picks? Yeah. Our picks. Yeah, I'm going to do mine. It's more for the, the blogger types. I found out WordPress has a thing. Tony, you might be interested in this. Forget the next, uh, which is the host of Real Tech for Real People. It's called Jetpack. It's a plug-in. It's free plug-in. And what is so cool about it, it gives you about 10 or 12 different features that, doesn't, that don't come with WordPress as we install it when we host it. So if, you're, if you have an account at WordPress.com, you get these things. You get to, to do uh, uh, site statistics. You get to do backup. Uh, you get to do some redirecting, all sorts of other cool aspects of it. So you install Jetpack as a plugin, register with WordPress.com for free, and now you have the ability to, to do the site metering and tracking and all that sort of thing on your site, even though you're not on WordPress.com site. Pretty powerful stuff for anybody that's using WordPress on their own, on a roll-your-own type of blog, and would like to get more insight and more control over what they're doing. Simple little thing, free to install. You go to plugins, you say search for Jetpack, all one word, J-E-T-P-A-C-K, and you're good mm -hmm. to go. Mine was boring. Yours is exciting. <laughs> oh, well, mine is, <clears throat> it's another app from a company called Algorithm, A-L-G-O-R-I-D-D-I-M. And this company, I think, is doing some great stuff. Uh, many moons ago now, I had to pick one of their other apps called DJ, which is a great music mixing app uh, for iOS only, I believe. And the good thing about it is, I mean, I was—I used to be the DJ back in like high school days, right? Mm -hmm. And I think about when someone's having a party, or whatever, loading up our family station wagon with all kinds of, you know, crap. Absolutely. Albums, mixers, turn it over. Now I look at what these guys are doing, what they did with music on the DJ app for like ten bucks. You got an iPad. That's all you need. And then uh, now they've done it again with VJ, uh, which well, I should do the same type of mix. Tony froze. Be interesting to see uh, on this recorded audio portion of it if Tony is actually still playing on Google Plus and if Google's getting it and it's actually getting blocked. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. You okay. uh, you dropped out. You froze there. Uh, so anyway, I was saying VJ is a great app uh, for mixing videos, any kind of videos, music videos, movies, TV shows, whatever you got uh, in your library, and it is cool. $9.99. If you're into that type of thing, I highly recommend checking it out uh, the VJ app. And it's iOS only, which is one of, this is one of the few times when I look at something and go, hmm, why can't they just move into the Android? <laughs> you had some great uh, pre-show music going there. I was certainly dancing in my chair. <laughs> I'm from the 80s. I probably should have been dancing on the CLA. <laughs> oh. There you go. <laughs> Well, Tony, I'll tell you what, it's been, a, it's been a great show, and I think it's time for us to, to put the last nail in the coffin on this one and say that that tech was real. Now, having done all that, are you using Blueberry PodPress or PowerPress on your site? Would you be willing to put it on to control or manage the podcasting part? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know much about it, but w is there a downside to putting it on at all? No, let me uh, end this broadcast. We'll flip over to Skype and we'll talk about it there. Okay.